to welcome you at the uh, lecture Deutsche Wohnen und Co. and Eignen, uh, which will be held by Johanna Kusiak. Mm. So this lecture series, I will introduce uh, a little bit the lecture series because uh, per perhaps you know that these lecture series are part or I would say even integral part of uh, an exhibition authored by Gabu Heindl and uh, curated by myself and Karolina Plaškova. Therefore, I have to also introduce myself. I'm a, a Dean of the Architecture of Faculty of Brno, who is at the moment, uh, which is at the moment running the Gallery of Architecture in Brno, Czech Republic. And uh, I'll be uh, moderating this evening or trying to somehow um, introduce the lecture and then maybe help with the discussion afterwards. So uh, let me uh, introduce the, the exhibition. The exhibition started in December and uh, it is uh, the exhibition called uh, Urban Conflicts Housing Manifesto. As I said, it is authored by a Viennese architect and also activist, I would say, Gabu Heindl. And what we are trying to do in the Gallery of Architecture is trying to tackle a housing crisis, which we consider, which I consider at least, and I guess also Gabu, she can she can uh, add up uh, if, she, if she wishes anything. But I think the uh, housing crisis can be considered global. And what we are trying to do also with this lecture series is to trying to show or maybe accumulate a knowledge about this uh, housing crisis and Thanks to the Gabu contacts, we are inviting uh, lecturers as Joanna and others to maybe report and also to give us an insight into, into this housing crisis that is happening on different places, basically of the globe, because we had also lecturers from uh, Vienna, but also uh, fr from Vancouver and other parts of the world. And I would say that this growing exhibition, or as, as Gabu says, this exhibition in making is trying to, first of all, accumulate a knowledge about this crisis. So the exhibition has also its archive, which consists of this lecture series, but also of texts and books that gradually grow on the table that, that you can see on the picture. And at the end, basically, the not the vernissage wasn't the most important thing, but what will be the most important thing will be the finissage, where we would like to introduce the housing manifesto that Gabu is working on during the whole uh, during the whole uh, um, exhibition. And not only the exhibition, but also the manifesto grows. And at the end of the exhibition, we would like to introduce what came up from accumulating this knowledge about this crisis in this housing manifesto that we would like to somehow contribute or distribute to the world. So this is the aim of the exhibition. And coming back, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to uh, welcome Joanna Kusiak that is already uh, that will held the fifth uh, lecture of the lecture series. And uh, let me introduce Joanna. Uh, so, uh, Jona is an urban studies researcher at the University of Cambridge and also Humboldt visiting fellow at the George Simmel Center for Metropolitan Studies in Berlin. She's also an activist with Deutsche Wohnen and Co. and Eignen. Her academic work focuses on land, property and law's role uh, in property regimes on more egalitarian terms, including new forms of democratic expropriation and social ownership. She also investigates the feasibility of progressive quasi -Machia Machiavellian approaches to coping neoliberal urban systems. Ultimately, her work seeks to rebuild the constructive capacity of critical urban studies, a capacity that has, that has been largely lost since the failure of modernism. So welcome, welcome, Joanna. Hello. Perfect. Hello. And welcome also Gabu, the author of the exhibition. I'm super glad to have you here and I'm looking forward for the presentation and I'm sure extremely important and extremely interesting interesting uh, discussion that will follow. And I would like to invite also 
all participants uh, of the of this of this online like i would say talk almost uh, to join us afterwards for the uh, for the discussion there is one last thing i have to do before we start and to also thank to the financial support of uh, ministry of culture of the czech republic also the architecture the czech architecture foundation state culture fund, fund fund state culture fund the city of brno and also uh, the institution i run at the moment which is faculty of architecture at the brno university of technology so uh, thanks uh, for the funding and also support from all of these institutions and now i think we can start maybe i can also if uh, gabu has a good connection at the moment so maybe uh, i would like to give also some, some space uh, to gabu which basically stands behind this uh, project that is at the moment happening or that is at the moment in the making as uh, as i would say so gabu please if there is anything you uh, i forgot or anything you want to add up so please now is the time um no, Jan, I think you did a very nice um, introduction. You hear where I am at the moment. <laughs> um, I am due to a lack in uh, trains. I'm um, um, I'm in a train. That's why I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Do you hear me? Yeah? Yes, you can yes. hear well. Okay. Um, I'm so happy, Joanna, to have you here um, on the International Women's Day, um, which I also find very important to actually talk about uh, the housing crisis that, of course, is a big Crisis, I would say, especially for those for women relating to the gender gap. For for I mean, not only but marginalized, any sort of intersectional, marginalized uh, people, where the housing crisis hits in much harder. So um, I just want to to say that I'm looking forward to a discussion um, about um, uh, your um, activism and and your initiative. And I think what is really interesting to us is um, I've put the word expropriation on the wall in Brno, in the Czech Republic. But of course, this word may sound harsher, more problematic than the way we use it in Germany or in Austria. And I think that's also an interesting, could be interesting to also discuss that. And also mm -hmm. how it's actually been understood in Germany, because also there you have a double um, history. But I'm handing over mm -hmm. to you right away. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Gabo, and uh, thank you also. Thank you also to the city of Brno for uh, and to all of you uh, for being able to participate. Um, obviously, I, I miss the idea of being in Brno now physically with you because I would love to see the exhibition itself. I just saw a couple of picture now during the presentation and before online, so it looks like a lovely exhibition, and I'm uh, very much regret not being able to see it um, live. Because indeed the problems uh, that we are facing in different cities are nonetheless uncanny similar. I agree also with what Jan said, housing crisis is global. The causes of housing crisis are also global. They have different iterations in different cities and they take different forms. But um, in most of the cities, uh, the root causes uh, is uh, some forms, I mean, first the privatization of housing and in many cities, uh, especially in Berlin, uh, the, also the financialization of real estate. And I saw that this financial aspect that housing is a human right, not a financial product. That was also one of the statements of, um, of your exhibition. And uh, at Deutsche von Deignen, we precisely want to tackle this two aspects of the housing crisis, financialization and uh, privatization. Um, you mentioned uh, that it's uh, International Women's Day today, and I think it is relevant. I, I think it's also relevant to say that there is housing crisis, of course, which is a global phenomena, and there's multiple other crises uh, superimposed on this crisis. I mean, we just coming out, or hopefully coming out, to be honest, we don't know of the COVID, of the global pandemics, where we also saw housing was one of the key points, because if you have to self-isolate, if there is a lockdown, then all kinds of uh, stakes um, depends on how, how are you how you're housed, your mental health, your family well-being, your working conditions, so individual and public health. 
and now I'm, I'm, I'm not on the train anymore, but I was an hour ago, I, I freshly came back from Warsaw, I'm, I'm German, but I'm also Polish, uh, where also the, the, the war in Ukraine is very palpable on the streets and it's very visible that this is bringing another round of housing crisis too, because we have uh, thousands and soon millions actually of people escaping the war and all of them will need to be housed and I spoke to some people at the municipality of Warsaw, I spoke also to some people at the municipality of Berlin and cities already now are, are struggling to coordinate and to, to try to house those people and, and I think what is unique about the domain of housing is that indeed any political crisis, any political change any even social demographic and lifestyle change in the end breaks down to the housing system. And therefore, uh, this housing system, the, the statement that housing is a human right becomes more and more relevant with every crisis and every systemic uncertainty that uh, we are facing these days. Um, I'll start maybe, I, I, uh, I looked briefly at the list of participants. Uh, we are in nice small groups. I understand that there will be also the, the talk is available online later. So there's potential viewers that we don't uh, see yet. Uh, however, I would like also that we make good use of the fact that we're in a small group and I would want to invite all of you to um, ask questions and, and imagine it as a, as a real discussion because precisely because these are such uh, exciting, controversial and political topics uh, that affect each city and precisely because Berlin through our referendum did become a little bit of a role model to other cities if not in terms of concrete solution but in terms of really a daring and courageous approach uh, to really tackle this problem at its root which is how the property is distributed and how housing is used as a financial speculation. Um, there is, we, we also as an initiative always had a lot of exchange with urban movements, housing movements from really around the world, everywhere, uh, especially since, uh, since we won the referendum, we, uh, we've been inundated with uh, questions and, and discussion. And I think that's, that's a good moment also to bring this energy further and to see uh, in, in each city what, what can we do and how, how could we discover new solutions. Um, Berlin the solution that the initiative Deutsche One and Co. and Eignen, um, just to start, what, what what have we done? What what was our project? I mean, and, and you mentioned right at the start this uh, word expropriation, uh, because yeah, if I were to, to sum it up in one line, we organized a public referendum um, in order to expropriate, that's the word we use, or actually socialize, which is the legal concept we've been using. And I'll explain the difference in a moment, but let's stick to expropriate. Um, corporate landlords, um, that is um, big corporations that are stock listed, that use housing to speculate on the financial markets, and they have enormous scale. I mean, we uh, propose to expropriate all landlords that own 3,000 or more apartments in Berlin. The biggest one, uh, Deutsche Wohnen, uh, when our initiative started, owned 120 thousand apartments in Berlin and in the meantime Deutsche Wohn fused with Vonovia and other corporate landlords so these numbers are even bigger so we have to do not with absolute monopoly but with a situation that really scale matters and uh, and this scale was crucial in bringing the crisis in a full swing to Berlin. I mean, Berlin, if you if you look at Europe, Berlin, Vienna, of course, I mean, Gabo is from Vienna, so of course Berlin always had its complex <laughs> to Vienna, in a sense, Vienna is probably the city uh, that uh, is known for, for having a lot of regulation of housing that are protecting tenant. But of course, if we look internationally, and especially if we put into game uh, Anglo-Saxon context, cities like London, or like New York, then Berlin has, has of course tenant protection laws, 
and very long tradition of uh, tenant movements. I mean, the first tenant move, organized tenant movements in Berlin date back to 19th century. So we have well over 100 years of tradition of, of tenant resistance. And we have this and this this um, decades of resistance, of course, brought changes to law. I mean, this this uh, complex tenant protections law, of course, they didn't appear out of the blue, but they were, uh, of course, the product of, of constant push and negotiation and, and mobilization of tenants. And uh, and so for years, it appeared that the Berlin housing system was not perfect, of course, and there's been gentrification push, no, uh, no doubt about it. But it seems that there are also effective ways of, of defending ourselves. I think one of the crucial um, one of the crucial element of this system, and, and I think it's very similar in Austria, uh, was the tenant um, organizations, Mietergemeinschaften or the Mieterverein, um, which operate in fact like a sort of tenant unions. So they're organizations that are law driven, that unite tenants, but importantly, um, one of the elements of membership is legal insurance which means that if you have a conflict with your landlord um, and you are a member of, of such a union, uh, then they would give you a, a skilled lawyer who specializes in tenant law and they would cover all the costs of court proceedings, no matter if you win or lose. This has been very, very important uh, instrument for, for self tenant self-defense on the individual scale because effectively that meant that even structurally weak actors, I'm, I'm saying tenants who are, let's say, migrants, they don't, they might not speak German, uh, they might not be well educated, they wouldn't dare to engage in a, in a legal conflict because, for example, they also knowledge about the law might be limited. Um, they were protected by it or they, they were put in a situation where defending their rights in the court was not a financial risk. One could only win, I mean, and if one lost, one didn't lost more than by not fighting. And also, again, for years, at least on the individual level, this has been a relatively good system for tenants to defend themselves. And this system start to significantly break down in terms of efficiency on a big scale with the appearance of this big scale corporate landlords. They came to being in um, in the decade of 2000s, um, in the course of privatization. Before the 2008 financial crisis, Berlin has its own little financial crisis, and also with the general push towards austerity, uh, towards neoliberal reforms, so-called cheap uh, or thin state, I mean, so less public spending and, and saving on budget, there's been a big project of privatization of housing. And unlike some countries in Eastern Europe, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure how the privatization of housing was done in Czech Republic. In Warsaw, for example, or in Poland, individual apartments were privatized to tenants, like in the UK uh, under Thatcherism. Whereas in Berlin, it, this were the whole portfolio, so thousands of apartments that were privatized to hedge funds, and to financial actors that later through multiple transactions uh, transformed into big stock listed companies. And, uh, and that means that there's this new, uh, new type of landlord appeared on Berlin scene, the corporate landlord. And we've been always highlighting that the corporate landlord is a completely different phenomena than a, a normal so-called so landlord like Mr. Müller, who just owns two houses and, and rents the apartments to tenants, um, because of several things. First and the most important is that even if obviously landlords and tenants, in all cases, they have conflicting interests, in the traditional landlord, I mean, the, the tenant is still in some sort of a client for traditional landlord. There might be conflict, but there's also this mutual dependency. This is not the case with corporate landlords because their only clients are actually the, the stakeholders. 
So the the housing market that's that's something that often is not fully understood by the average member of the public that um, the this this landlords they actually do not operate primarily on the housing market. They use the housing market to operate more efficiently at the financial markets, but they do not orient themselves towards housing markets, and therefore the the tenant is not the client. The client is their shareholder, um, and that that means that no matter what what is the dynamic on the housing market, no matter what are the demographic factors they are obliged to re-up the investments of the shareholders to increase the return of the capital on the capital which means that they will always try to raise the rent and to lower the maintenance costs and this is something structural it doesn't it's it's not a you know it's it's not a matter of they're good people or bad people it's just they're corporate people they they're hired to do so basically i mean that's the that's a very structural factor that makes them very different from an uh, average landlord and of course in the case of berlin this job was partly making even easier made even easier by the fact that there was demographic pressures as well because berlin has been continuously growing in terms of population because of all three factors. There's a positive natural, uh, and there's a lot of births, like more births than deaths in Berlin. There's been a wave of refugees some years ago, and now we're uh, surely expecting another one. Um, and um, and there's a lot of migration also from, from other cities, other countries. So Berlin is growing, there is demographic pressure. And these corporate actors were just even amplifying it uh, through through the operation. They also are more, much more effective in, in rising the rents because of the scale and because uh, of the system. Even if there are these legal protections, these corporations they have their own legal departments where they hire uh, very well paid lawyers whose sole job is to find loopholes in the tenant laws. That means that the usual ways of defending oneself through the law, they were not enough when confronted with uh, with also a legal offensive that this corporation started to uh, to make the rents higher. And they were using this scale effect too, because if someone owns thousands of apartments um, in a given district, then it's easy to manipulate the benchmarks. For example, one of the benchmarks of public policy that uh, is supposed to help keep the rent reasonable in Berlin is so-called Mietspiegel, the rent mirror, which is basically an average rent from a given area. But obviously, if you have thousands of apartments in a given area, then by raising the rent a little bit in all of them, then you, you make the whole benchmark to go up. And then, of course, justifies the later further increases and creates some sort of vicious circle. So uh, when the activists in Berlin uh, noticed that at some point that with this new type of corporate landlords, if we keep our struggle only in the domain of the tenant law by trying to fight for new rent control regulations, even if we succeed, we will always be on the defensive because, uh, of course, then their lawyers will find new ways to go around those laws. And this, and obviously, you know, tenant movements, uh, they do it out of need and in a free time, whereas the, there you have people who are hired and well paid to do just that. So it, it, this is an even, an even game. It would always be a cat and mouse game. And so we understood that um, the only way to really tackle the housing crisis in Berlin at its root would be to address it as its roots. And that means property relation. That means to, to, to say no um, to the speculation with housing um, on the financial markets. And that means ultimately to expropriate uh, these corporations. And this seemed like a great radical idea that uh, at the same time didn't seem very probable to happen um, until some of the activists uh, 
rediscovered Article 15 of the German Constitution. I say rediscovered uh, because Article 15 of the German Constitution has been there, of course, all the time since the Constitution was written in 1949, uh, but has never been used historically. So it was also genuinely forgotten by lawyers, by the public sphere. And it is an article, a clause, a legal clause that says that um, land or crucial um, resources, including also um, special natural resources or, or environmental protection uh, resources, could be socialized. Here's this word socialization that we'll uh, come back to. Um, for, could be socialized for the purpose of socialization. This this is, sounds like a tautology, but that's exactly how it's written. But that means um, they can be socialized for public good. If you could argue that, uh, I mean, that's a legal interpretation of this clause. If you could argue that um, that the situation of quasi-monopoly uh, by a private actor could be harmful to the society. Um, this article has a very, very interesting history. I mean, the idea of socialization was present already in the constitution of the Weimar Republic, and then it was rewritten to the constitution of the Bundesrepublik in 1949. Um, and it was actually taken for granted. I mean, in the long discussion uh, about the constitution, pretty much all the parties, including Christian Democrats, the, the today's CDU, I mean, all by, but the, the radical uh, Liberal Party or FDP, they were for this article. So it, it had support of both conservatives and social democracy because in 1949 there was also a broad understanding that um, um, that economic monopolies may be dangerous to democracy. And it was not an abstract understanding. It, of course, came from the fact that everyone still had very freshly in mind how big German industry helped Hitler uh, in his rise to power. So the idea was that the democratic state should have a tool to potentially break such a monopoly or such a, such a what is called in German law, wirtschaftliche Macht, so economic power, if this concentration of economic power can be considered harmful for the society. And so this clause was written into the constitution and indeed never used, forgotten by the lawyers, forgotten by the public, and then we, uh, I mean, dug out uh, by the by the housing activists who started playing with this idea, maybe that's what we could use to expropriate these big corporations. And at first, I must say, and that's, you know, politically also an important lesson, at first this idea was controversial even in this leftist activist environment. In a sense, everyone thought yeah, that it would be great, but many considered it's too radical, this would never be accepted by the public. This is, uh, it's a nice dream, but, um, it's not something that is really achievable. But then also the group of activists first drafted the, the legal strategy, interestingly and importantly, I think this were not lawyers who drafted the first legal strategy of how could it be possible. Then they brought it to the lawyers and um, the lawyers themselves were surprised that actually, yes, I mean, no one seems to have thought about it, but it would be legally impossible. Then the initiative went public in, in 2019 and there was a long referendum campaign because if this Article 15 was a, uh, was a core strategy, I mean the legal argument how it would be possible, um, the political engine of the initiative was the referendum because even if it's legally possible, of course, that needs to be legislated to happen. It didn't seem that the government would freely legislate it. So the idea was to create a political push through a, a public referendum. That's also something that Berlin has a lot of experience with. I mean, there, there's been a lot of referendum initiatives in the recent years. Some of them you might have heard about, like the um, initiative to save the Tempelhof airport from, from being uh, so from being uh, covered by real estate, I mean, it's still a sort of an unusual public park. There's been another referendum to deprivatize or remunicipalize Berlin Waterworks. So 
um, I think it's it's always worth showing that the success of, of our referendum also comes from this long history and gathering knowledge from many different initiatives um, that then activists brought this knowledge together. Uh, when we went public with the word expropriation, of course, it was hugely controversial. And at the same time, it really took off in the way that even we haven't fully predicted the scope of success. I mean, already by March uh, 2019, the polls were showing around 50% of support for the for the referendum that wants to expropriate uh, 250,000 apartments in Berlin. So we're talking billions and billions of euro, almost un unimaginable um, worth of assets. Um, and how many companies? How many companies? That's a very interesting question too, because um, eight or more, because what we've discovered in the process also, not just we, but also some investigative journalists, as it is in highly speculative global financial capitalism, there's some of these companies that we know and they're big and public and they're just officially stock listed company like Deutsche Wohnen or like Bonovia or Pers or Achilles. But uh, but Pairs exactly the the um, the one of them Pairs was hiding um, under a lot of subsidiaries. So what we called in Berlin the mailbox landlords, which were a lot of firms that appeared as a separate firms, although they didn't have even any headquarters, physical headquarters in Berlin or, or not even address. So the the tenant would know just the name of the company. And the address would be a mailbox in Luxembourg and no one would know who actually owns it. And then investigative journalists from the corrective, uh, collective uh, discovered that uh, I think at least 150 of those companies in reality belong to PES International, so that's a huge financial um, corporation. And to be honest, because there's no public register of property, we cannot know if, but probably one can safely assume it wasn't the only case. So, uh, so that's also you know that also shows something uh, about the system. But so the, there's there's a list of the companies we could track and probably many more potentially that are yet to be tracked. Uh, the scale at least is yet to uh, become publicly known. Um, in any case, I think uh, the the success and that's also a good tip maybe for, for other initiatives and in other countries, surely the, the big success that we had in terms of reaching to the public, and maybe I, I you know, it's not a spoiler by now to say that in September uh, 2021, we did win this referendum um, with more than a million votes in objective terms and with 56% of the voters saying yes. So it, it has been the most radical, but also, uh, the uh, the most unprecedentedly successful referendum in the history of Berlin. No other referendum has had so many votes, also in absolute terms. And uh, that doesn't mean that expropriation did happen, and we'll we'll get there in a moment. Uh, but uh, the source of our success, I think, uh, came from um, several uh, several factors. I think the the initiative was very very skilled in navigating between the sphere of law and the sphere of politics, uh, by which which had many layers of, of how uh, was it done. I mean, first, you know, even if this initiative is very radical, because we're talking about expropriating so much property, it's also been radically legal, because what we're using in a way is very radical, but what we're using is the most conservative sphere, one could say, the sphere of law that changes very slowly and what we're using is is the german constitution which is the most sedimented stable um i mean it's a fundamental legal document of uh, of the of of the country uh, of the of the whole system so and that of course was very hard to dismiss so that that made us invulnerable to claims that this is just a crazy radical initiative that we don't even need to look at because this is a bunch of crazy people because no media can dismiss an initiative that leverages the German constitution at least they have to check if it is meaningful and that also um, made us 
effectively outsource a lot of legal research because as soon as the initiative uh, strongly went public, a lot of public institutions, also political parties, think tanks started ordering expensive expertise document by top lawyers to ask, is it even possible? And uh, most of these documents, uh, expertise, independent expertise showed, yes, it is from legal point of view, it's possible. I mean, obviously, if it's politically possible, people will vote for that. That's a separate question. But legally speaking, it is possible. And that gives us a lot of external legitimacy. So in some sense, um, we used the German constitution to leverage the legitimacy of our claim. And to me, as a as a researcher, not to, to frame it in more theoretical terms, it's also is an interesting case of how, in the face of of neoliberalism, which is and and financial markets, which are operate on a very quick timelines, and the push to to uh, of neoliberalism for undoing uh, a lot of social policies have been proceeding very quickly, how because the whole country moved to the neoliberal side so rapidly, the, the, the domain that was perceived as conservative, like the domain of law, uh, have suddenly become progressive. Because in the end, conservative in its classical sense means something that changes very slowly, sometimes that, something that protects the past. And if the past, uh, as it is in the case of Germany, if the past means a strong social democracy, then in some sense to be conservative and to be progressive might become one position at this certain point, because it is the neoliberal position that tries to undo the past of social democracy. Um, so it's, uh, it, this is a very interesting alliance, you know, between between the conservative domain of law and uh, radical housing movements, and it's an alliance that show that it's, it's really worth to search for solutions in, in unusual places. Um, and also, this double strategy, political and legal, can be also observed in 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 the campaign how it was run. I mean, from this difference also between this two legal terms, because what we want to do in real terms is socialization. The word we use is expropriation, and that's been also a form of recognition that for broad public mobilization, it's always easier to have a negative campaign because everyone agrees this by now in Britain, everyone agrees that these corporations um, are wrong. I mean, that you cannot uh, use the housing like that to speculate. So the claim to expropriate is controversial, it's strong, it's sexy in the media, it's, it's something that is easy to mobilize around. But uh, under this negative claim of expropriation, um, in a sense, we, we carry the very positive program. So I, I often say that this initiative has been anti-systemic and pro-systemic at the same time. I mean, it's been anti-systemic because it wants to destroy this system of financial domination but it's also pro-systemic because the proposition goes much further. It's not just take this property away from those corporations. It is about how we're going to build a new housing system that will be socially owned. And um, because also legally speaking, the idea of socialization means not just the, the sheer property terms, not just the fact that it does need to be publicly owned. It also needs to be democratically managed. So coming back to Gabo's question about how the word expropriation looks in, in Eastern Europe, I also come from Eastern Europe, I come from Poland, the, at least in Poland we do have a word socialization, it is um, called uspołecznienie, and this is something actually that's deeply rooted in our traditions as well, because this word socialization, uspołecznienie, was written, it was one of the postulates of first Solidarność movement in 1981. It wasn't about housing then, it was about the social ownership of factories by the, by the workers. But the very concept is the same. The idea is not state property. It's important to say socialization is not nationalization. It's not a state property. It's a democratic, socially owned property. So it's its own form, but 
it is closer to cooperative to workers cooperative or tenants cooperative than to this idea of of rigid state ownership that has uh, such a controversial name in, be in between in eastern europe and and not only in eastern europe and uh Yes, and, and, and I think that it was also important in the campaign to have this negative claim and to have also this very developed positive system. And if you look, I mean, if someone reads um, in German, if you want to look at the web page of our campaign, Deutsche Bonn and Co. and Eignen, you will see that the campaign has prepared a very detailed documents about how this new housing system would look like. Uh, what would be the, is the legal form of the institution that would manage this housing? And still, uh, the, uh, I mean, this, this conceptual work is, is ongoing and uh, addresses all kinds of questions of housing distri distribution that would be crucial. For example, if uh, such a public body owns 250,000 apartments, how to ensure they are distributed in a fair way, that there's no discrimination, in terms of race or class, how to how to make sure that housing is adjusted to the needs, whatever that old people have apartments with elevators and families have the bigger ones and so on. So it's it's a lot, and which is always more difficult with every political initiative. It's very easy to say no to the to the pathological system that we know, but it takes much more effort to really develop in detail an alternative of how we would want the world to look like. So, to uh, to end on a more uh, ambiguous note, of course, as it is uh, in, in contemporary politics, we did win the referendum and it does not mean, it's not automatic that this expropriation or socialization will happen. So, unfortunately, uh, unlike in Switzerland, for example, in German system, a public referendum is something that is politically binding but it's not legally binding. Politically binding means that one million votes is very hard for the government to ignore or dismiss. Um, in absolute terms, also one million votes is more than any political party got in this election, because there was also a general election uh, beyond, uh, beyond the, the referendum itself. And also, if we were a political party, speculatively, we would have gotten absolute majority in Berlin. Of course, we are not a political party, so it's a speculation, but it's just to show the, the political mobilization and the political power that we um, managed to mobilize. And of course, the system, at the same time, it's not a secret that the winning party, SPD, uh, was already during the election campaign um, against uh, socialization, which is really, really ironic again, and again shows the political shift, because this was the SPD, the very same party that really fought for the Article 15 in 1949 to make sure it is there in the Constitution. So in some sense, if they were politically smart, they could be the, the ones capitalizing most on, on our success, saying this was our idea. But of course, it's not like that in contemporary politics, and there's been a lot of links between real estate lobby and the uh, ruling party. And, and what we can observe is the usual um, course of political freezing and postponing. So the government proposed there will be commission. The commission will investigate the possibilities of socialization. And um, of course, that uh, that means potentially that might never happen. Uh, but that does not mean that it will never happen. I mean, everything in the political game is in a way still open. And for the movement itself, it's also a challenge uh, of agility because these are different to, to mobilize for referendum is a different game that to become effectively a lobby that tries to push government to implement the results of the referendum. It demands different kinds of political actions and different kinds of political tools. And it demands also maintaining the pressure, which is of course always difficult because there's many other things happening in the world and it is very hard to maintain high, high pressure for a very long time. But as of now, we are succeeding in a sense that the movement is still um, it's still well over a thousand people organized in all districts of Berlin 
and still capable to mobilize, to protest. There were, you know, there were our protests always during the first the coalition negotiations, then during all the actions that are relevant to housing. So, um, in some sense, I think we'll end with the famous quote, you know, someone asked what, what is the result of the French Revolution and dances we are yet to see, you know, even 300 years later. And I think we are yet to see. I mean, we, we've already influenced a lot the, the public system. We definitely shifted the whole political debate in terms of what is now perceived as radical and what is perceived as, um, you know, just a mild alternative. And, uh, we we made the the scale of the problem and the political mobilization against the problem like very powerful and uh, we we have to in a sense we have to maintain the pressure so that's how it end. okay Jonah, perfect <laughs> thanks for the uh, lecture you know it was also interesting for me to have a lecture without slides because we as architects we are somehow uh, obsessed, you know, with uh, graphical like accompanying <laughs> the lecture, but it was it was a perfect uh, speech. So thank you for that. It was uh, really like uh, fruitful, and I think a great base for the debate that will surely follow. So maybe uh, I mean, Gabu, it's it's yours. So I, I'll try to step back, and then maybe I'll, I'll join the discussion. But I think uh, you know, Gabu. It's it's uh, it was her initiation of this topic that is now being in Brno. So, uh, Gabu, uh, please. No, you know, you don't step back. But um, I'm just happy that I'm seated. You see, I'm outside the train, um, and I could follow all the time, but I just didn't want you to follow me. Uh, uh, hey, thank you very much. I, I also agree with you, Jan. We are used to images, and it's good to concentrate for once. And I was actually admiring your camera. <laughs> nice camera which moved with you. Hey, I have a question. You said it was very important um, to set up a system that makes clear that it's not in the end the state owning and the state being able to be democratic or oppressive. Because that's the most biggest worry of, of generations who have actually seen um, governments turn over. So, could you just elaborate how you make sure that there is no exclusions, like everybody has accessibility, all the things that you kind of mentioned as questions. Mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting to just discuss a little bit what these uh, parameters and, and uh, policies are you install. Yeah. yeah, I mean, of course, what uh, what we propose is, is like a first draft of, of how the system would look like, because obviously that would be open also for democratic discussion, because it's not that someone just imposes even the best system from the outside. But I think that it's a mixture of different elements that are known from other contexts. I mean, for, for sure, the, the organization of scale, I mean, if we think 250,000 apartments, it's really a lot. If they will be centrally managed, it's very easy to, you know, turn it into a very rigid system. So the idea is of, of this organic realm where you have also some bodies that operate on the level of district and that are close um, to the tenants. However, uh, we also think of um, accountability uh, towards the rest of the city. So the idea is that although tenants, so the, the idea is that it would be managed uh, in, in, with a mixture of direct and representative democracy, and it would be uh, people who, who would uh, be elements of this of this managing body. Uh, you would have some some representatives of the tenants. You have the representatives of people who are managing these apartments, administrators. You'd have representatives of Berlin Senate, so general politics. But importantly, also, you would have representatives of Berlin population who is not living in this housing. This is very important because this often becomes a problem with cooperatives, that they become these clubs, that if you're a member of corporate, it's fantastic, but if you're not a member, it's impossible to get in and have any influence. And if we're talking about the big scale like that, obviously whatever is happening with this 250,000 apartments would influence the whole city. So there needs to be accountability beyond people who live there, who work there. There needs to be accountability um, for the whole city. Then there's, uh, of course, 
you know, still, I mean, not not all the system, I mean, some of the elements of the system are still being discussed and we just show possible alternate, alternatives to discuss. I mean, the most important question is always the question of, of housing distribution, where you would have a mixture of, you know, according to needs, but also some drawing system, you know, so it's a mixture of luck and needs, of course, that, that you have to balance. I mean, at the moment, at the market, of course, there's only one factor, it's money, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, whereas, you know, you have, uh, and in terms of needs, there's all kinds of needs, right? There's needs that are according to health, because, you know, people are older, they need accessibility, the the needs related to the size of family. And I think also what is, important with this size of housing portfolios is to have um, that it allows for more mobility so one of the side effects of the Berlin housing crisis was uh, of course uh, that's also because of the specificity of the German system that there was the mobility within the city was very difficult what does it mean that let's say we have a family with two kids and the parents divorce and all of a sudden they don't need one big apartment they need to small apartments, but they are very close to each other so that they can co-parent and the kid can go to the same school. Or the other way around, you have a young couple who need small apartment, but then they do have kids that they need a, a bigger apartment. Or you have people who work from home. And so, so there's um, not only that certain type of people have certain needs, but also the needs, the housing needs change throughout the life because of different demographic factors and just life events. And till now in Berlin, because the system has been so that you, if you have a contract, a rental contract, it's relatively hard to raise the rent. But if you move between apartments, very easy to raise the rent. That means people were this, this systemically discouraged was unable to um, to be mobile because sometimes you know if you wanted to change. To a, a big apartment to too small, it turns out that even one small would cost in the end much more than your big one because of the difference uh, from how old your contract is. And that that kind of mobility, I mean, if, if an organization have a big portfolio of apartments, it's also much easier to facilitate the swaps and, and this kinds of mobility as, as new needs emerge. Then again, we also acknowledge that there's some groups of population in, in special needs, like the, the victims of domestic violence, who sometimes need very quickly a small apartment, but, but very quickly, or the refugees and so on. So this, it's not an easy fix, easy solution. I mean, there, it needs to be acknowledged that housing is an ex extremely complex question. But this question till now has been answered only by one factor, means who has more economic power to get a better apartment. And what we're trying is to design a system that takes also a lot of different factors under, um, under consideration. And not just in terms of housing. I mean, even if this is not our priority, then of course it is a matter of fact that a lot of these houses also have little shops on the ground levels and uh, that also means, you know, in the recent years, we've been observing also the, the high uh, rising of commercial rents, which also tends to push out the local businesses, small shops, cafes, I mean, the businesses that emerge organically through the city and exchange them with big chains because no one else could afford those rents. So there's also a possibility of, of this kind of intervention in terms of uh, planning on the district level, what kind of businesses also we we uh, need to support. So the, the 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 social ownership of housing really opens the way to just have much more democratic influence of all kinds of uh, factors of of uh, how both housing and and also commercial uh, spaces in this in public spaces in the cities are shaped. Okay, I just. I just want to make sure that everybody please um, ask questions. Uh, I just would like to know why did you call it expropriation and not socialization from the beginning? Mm -hmm. I try to mention it a little bit. Um, it is, uh, I think, because of political strategy. I mean, as a political campaign, you know, we uh, we need to be sexy. <laughs> we want to mobilize. We need to have it understandable. I mean, socialization, Vergesellschaftung, it's a legal term that, to be honest, before us, before our initiative, 
people barely knew what does it mean. I mean, it just was, and it's not like, you know, it's a long word. It's um, not known. It's, it's much harder to understand. And as I, as I mentioned also, it is also a well-known fact in politics that it is easier to organize people around a negative campaign I mean, all kinds of revolution. I mean, the, the, you know, the big, the heat of the mobilization often comes from let's get rid of this, uh, this bad, bad people, bad corporations, bad, bad forms of, of politics. Um, and, uh, and that, uh, that, that helped us. But at the same time, as I said, having this positive concept of socialization in a way smuggled within a negative uh, concept, I think it was a very politically smart move that allowed us to be anti-systemic and pro-systemic at the same time. Jan, please. Yeah, actually, uh, maybe a comment, I'll try to turn it into the question. <laughs> actually, I like also this, this uh, idea of dismantling something and, you know, building up something new because i think it's also connected to the false like idea about ne neoliberalism that it's something about like uh, ab about freedom or about dismantling a state maybe but i think it's much more fruitful fruitful to think about these mechanisms as hijacking the state for certain purposes and then what you are doing is to report repurposing maybe a law or maybe some state mechanisms to something different or to, to different goals. So it's not about like, uh, you know, uh, about freedom and at oppressive statehood. It's rather something about attuning the system into different like goals. And this is, I think, uh, what is more like uh, appropriate to the situation that it is not that the neoliberal, neoliberal, neoliberal uh, like mechanisms or policies is not about uh, doing state smaller because it's just about, you know, uh, making the state doing something, something, and it might be uh, it might be different goals than than uh, maybe uh, uh, just a situation uh, with uh, housing. So and I think it's somehow interconnected with this idea that you have anti-systemic like movement underlined with some systemic thought at the end you know so i think uh, that, that there might be uh, it might be connected concepts uh, yeah I, I i don't know gabu wanted to add up something no 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 i wanted to uh, join in because i felt maybe how would you turn it from states buying or from the commune buying to social ownership um yeah i think that's um that's something that was often misunderstood, especially by international media. That I remember I was responsible for um, speaking to international media after we won the referendum, and often I had to undo the claim that we what we want is to buy back a private apartment. Obviously, the crucial difference between buyback and socialization is the question of money, the question of how much it costs. Because buyback uh, means that it occurs at commercial prices, uh, which is um much i mean multiplication much more than uh, this uh, that the cost of uh, uh, that, that these corporations or hedge funds before paid for this apartment because as in many countries also in germany it's been a crime in itself how cheaply this housing was privatized and so the idea was not to ruin the budget of Berlin by paying commercial prices for this housing, like paying, you know, many times, 10 times more than, than, uh, than the this, this city sold these apartments for. And the big question that is also a, a both political and a legal question uh, that is still in the air is how much would it really cost and the differing opinions on that. Because um, what the Article 15 says that such a socialization has to um, occur with compensation, which means that uh, these corporations will be compensated. And the cost of this compensation is not legally prescribed. I mean, there's some legal, um, uh, there's, there, there's some general legal rules 
um, how this compensation should be calculated, but it is actually a political decision, uh, and it's uh, the law says that the the amount of compensation would need to be legislated with a separate law, which means not only the state has to write a socialization law, but then also a separate law that um, decides on uh, how and how much do we compensate. And the legal prescriptions in terms of the decision how much it should be only says that there should be a balance between the interests of well, the, so the, the, the expropriated, so the, the corporations, and the general interest of the society, because it's a socialization. So on the one, like the, the way, you know, there's this legal image of weighing interests. And so on one side, we have the corporation and on one side, we have the common good or the good of the society as such. And this is a tricky and, and highly, highly political question, of course. And, and we know it's very easy to say what is the interest of the corporation, of course, like the, their interest is to have it as much as possible. But how to calculate? in financial terms, what is the interest of the society? It's a very, very tricky question. And of course, we as the initiative, we had our own proposition of, of how to how calculate. Namely, um, if we talk about interest of society, and if we think about, legally speaking, what would be the aim of the socialization? The aim of socialization is to transform the housing market so that it can serve the society, so that the housing provision um, is, uh, you know, it's for the housing provision of the whole society. So the way we propose to calculate the compensation would be the compensation, that the compensation would be the highest amount that, um, that of of uh, of money that could be um, loaned. I mean, so so the city would need to, uh, or this institution would need to take a loan that could be then repaid from the year from the rents, uh, while the rents would be kept at affordable level. And the definition, the the standard definition in Berlin of affordable uh, rent is the rent uh, that does not exceed 30% of income of, of a tenant. So the idea would be that, um, you know, the, it, it would be in public interest to have this housing provision and to, to be able to pay this compensation back from the income from rent. Because, and of course, we got a lot of pushback in general. I mean, one of the biggest arguments uh, always raised against our initiative was that it would be too expensive, it's not financially viable, the city would spend the money and, and go bankrupt, which is obviously not true because if we think, I mean, why are these housing assets so precious uh, to start with? I mean, they're so precious because they generate income. And these corporations bought them because they, they bring profit. And that means that once the public body owns them, the public body will also have this monthly profit. And so we calculated that even if we push the rents back down, like lower them in relation to what they are now in these corporations, this uh, apartments would still bring really significant amount of money that would allow not just to pay back this compensation, but also to build new apartments and to expand the housing provision. So um, obviously, this uh, this is a self um, this is a self sustaining model. Now coming back to the the question of how big the conversation, how much it would cost. I mean, obviously, there's also many different other calculation propositions alternative to ours. I want to also raise the question that legally, indeed, this compensation, we know that it can be anything between one euro and one euro below the market price. It cannot be the market price because then it would not legally count as socialization. This indeed would be buyback. Um, so, uh, and of course, it seems... Uh, not particularly probable that it would be one euro. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that a lot of uh, um, assets in East Germany were privatized for one Deutsche Mark. So there is a historical precedence uh, that, you know, this would be technically possible as well. And, and it's good to say it also to keep that in mind, you know, there's been precedents like that as well. So this sum is really political and uh, the decision would be political. And if it's political, it means, uh, as in other cases, it depends a lot on the, on the pressure from both sides, from real estate lobby and uh, from the base. I would have another question because um, I think you 
beautiful issue. I mean, like, as you can imagine, I'm a big fan of, of uh, really um, this initiative. I think it's amazing as what it has achieved and also what it has made thinkable. But now about society interest, knowing that all these asset funds are actually also pension funds to so many people in different countries. Like, like we've seen this um, calculations how, you know, like somebody's pension is basically mm -hmm. in a fund which again owns, is one of these corporate landlords or part of that. And now there's this other argument that we cannot, it's too big to fail or too big to actually become socialized supposedly again because of uh, it would then actually fail a lot of uh, hopes in pensions. How do you, how do you counter argue that? Well, I mean, obviously we call for, for divestment from, uh, from the pension funds. I mean, the pension funds are not structurally forced to in, in invest in housing. I mean, there's plenty of other options for investment. So there would be a way of, of moving this money to start with. And uh, so that's the one thing. The second, of course, is that, yes, this, is a, this shows, in a sense, the perversion of the system, because in Berlin, you could even track how, you know, you would have a tenant who has a pension fund, let's say for Allianz, private one. So he or she is paying monthly the money that indirectly causes his or her own rent to rise. So it is often like a very direct vicious circle that needs to be systemically solved and broken. And, and again, for both of these cases, I mean, the... Um, I mean, we understand on the on the logic of individual life in general, like one can understand why individuals decide to invest in property as a way of backing up their retirement plans in the terms of systemic in face of systemic insecurity. However, this is this cannot be a solution because that that's a solution that's biting. Either it's biting directly them, like in this vicious loop, so it's biting, biting the younger generations, the kids and the grandkids who then cannot afford the apartment. So, yes, we understand, we acknowledge this is connected and we call for divestment and for disconnecting, but this cannot be used as an argument to justify this system. Okay. okay. Matthias, Matthias Moroder uh, has a question or would like to add up something, something or continue the discussion. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yes, I would have a question. Uh, could you maybe say something about the organizational structure of the campaign? Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, the second question that, that adds up to that is, are there maybe parallels between the campaign organization and the model of social democratic ownership that you propose mm -hmm. okay yeah thank you for this question um as for organization structure of the campaign as, a, as i'm a polish i can joke about it it's it, it's it's the german organization it's it's very structured and for a good i mean for, for good good results are coming out of it i mean so the in in the peak of the campaign this were between 2000 and 3000 uh, activists in the whole berlin and when i say activists of course the amount of engagement each had was different. It could be from putting leaflets in the mailbox to, you know, strategizing the next um, political move, um, the, the, and all of these um, aspects are needed. The organization was divided in working groups, um, and I'll try to name all of them, hopefully not forgetting uh, any one of them. This, they were growing too. There were new working groups added also in, in certain stages. But there's been um, which is this strategic, um, more like planning, intellectual, legal um, group that uh, develops legal and political strategy. There's been very important um, start, Agi. So this, this is the working group that um, helped tenants self-organize and share knowledge. So they would go to, you know, to buildings that were affected uh, because, for example, of particularly aggressive landlord and give them little seminars. How do you self-organize? How do you organize a tenant meeting? Like, so so the idea was, it was very important again because it allowed also for growing, like for passing down the knowledge and, and uh, in a way developing a broad base that is self-sustainable and, and can self-organize. 
there's been media and press, of course, especially in the later phase of campaign, responsible for, for, for PR and with the sub-chapter of social media just dedicated to that. Um, there's been um, later Right to the City idea, which addressed directly the non-German speaking um, part of Berlin population. There's been actions, I guess, or actions, or all kinds of happenings, um, events, because we really um, use the whole range of political tools. There was this legal strategy, there was a referendum, but there was also all the other things known from the normal activist politics, you know, like big happenings, demonstrations. Of course, the, the COVID uh, has made it a little bit more complicated, but then all, all kinds of events that also attracted media and public attention. Uh, obviously, in the crucial phase of the referendum, there was Zammel, AGE, which means the working group responsible for coordinating the collection of signatures, because we needed a lot of them. And then the Zamel AGE, then there was, you know, there, there was this functional division in different working groups in terms of the content. But then uh, during the collection phase, there was this another layer that was geographical division. So that, that was divided into districts and, and parts of the districts so that you have a base also in every district that was responsible for coordinating collecting signature in the given district so and then later you know obviously in some districts it was easier to collect the signatures in others you know places like Kreuzberg where you know you you would have broad support and a big base and then they would help you know other districts that it was they were bigger maybe physically or more challenging so there was this intergeographical support as well so there's that. Um, I hope I didn't forget about any of these working groups. But importantly, also there's been a, a so-called Kreis coordinating circle that uh, meets weekly and discusses, and it consists of of representatives of all the working groups. So that it brings the knowledge to this coordination circle um, in order to make decision. And then there's a weekly plenum that um, then later, especially during the COVID, occurred online. Uh, still occurs online every Tuesday, where everyone who is a member can participate and all the important, some decisions are made on the level of working groups and some decisions are made on the level of uh, coordination circle. But if there's any decision that's controversial, um, then it's being discussed and potentially voted at the plenum. So you have also this direct democracy um, aspect of that. Um, now the second question, if, if this organizational structure is parallel to the structure of the campaign, I don't think so, not in this way, because it's uh, it's a completely different set of tasks and therefore these different sets of tasks would need a different structure. But for sure, um, again, as I said, the initiative itself was possible because of this long learning process for different initiatives. And obviously there's been a lot of learning. And in terms of, you know, how to um, balance the, you know, the component of representation and direct democracy and so on. And these are not easy questions and not never the questions you can ultimately solve forever, but you can only solve them by gaining experience, what works in what context. And, and there's been a lot of experience because it's been quite a big operation in the end. Can I add a question? Um, um, how about money? I mean, it's, uh, mm -hmm. even if everybody works for free, I don't know, so it would be yeah. interesting. You need some budget. How would you get that yeah. together? So, yes, um, at first everybody worked for free and all, even later in the key phase, almost everybody worked for free. I, I come to um, that in a moment. Then there was a big crowdfunding campaign and most of the money, especially in the early phase, came from crowdfunding. Then once, you know, in, in Berlin system, it is so that to organize a referendum, there's two phases of collecting signature. One where you have to collect um, a smaller number of signature, then they check the legal possibility if, if what you propose is legally viable. And then you have this proper phase where we had to collect, um, I think 200,000 signatures. And for that, you, you also do some budget from the, like once you make it through the first hurdle, you get also some budget from, from the city because you acknowledge as a, um, democratic political actor. So there's been some money coming uh, from that for the for the big campaign, for the actual referendum campaign. And in the um, 
in the referendum campaign, I mean, there's been a couple of, not many, but a couple of office positions that were paid. I mean, these were activists too, but they needed them. Uh, one needed someone who's there full time because, you know, if people have other jobs, they cannot be there full time. So at some point, there, there's been a couple of coordinate like, office positions that uh, that were paid um, and full time. And then there's been expenses, you know, some things like promotional videos, uh, design of posters and so on. Some of them were done for free because people, artists also volunteered in this way by offering, but for some services you have to pay or it's fair to pay or you, you know, you pay a smaller price, but, but you still need to pay some, something for the labor and it's fair as well. So, uh, so there's been also this kind of um, expenses or, or, you know, being paid, so to say, for the services. Perfect. Uh, I would like to welcome also Karolina Plaškova, who is actually uh, also responsible for the whole lecture series, series and the exhibition. She's basically a curator or co-curator of the of the exhibition. So uh, and uh, she would like to pose a question. So welcome Karolina and pose a question. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm late. I was uh, at a course and I'm still at a course room. So if there are some noises in the background, tell me. I have a question. I wanted to, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't hear everything, but I, I know something about the movement. Uh, but first of all, I was kind of stunned uh, by the information about how you actually calcul calculate the compensations that basically they are in no way related to the prices or, or the market prices of the of the flats or of the housing. It, it basically only relates to the income, the future income of the, or let's say, imagined uh, future income of those residents then uh, and then basically counted in how many years they are able to pay back the loan right um the city not the not the tenants mm -hmm. yeah, yeah but it it's counted by the income of the tenants kind of um is, are you still speaking or is it time now for me no <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it's not in no way. I mean, so so um, let me let me correct it so you understand. So the the legal idea is this is a balance, right? And so the but the question of balance is legally you need to balance. And on one end you you balance the interest of the corporations, and we know this interest of the corporations to get a market price or as close as to market price as possible because market price itself is legally impossible because this would not be socialization. And on the other end, the common interest and the question is how to calculate this common interest. What does it mean? Because this doesn't have as obvious price tag as the as the interest of of the corporation. So what that's our way of proposing um, how how to balance it. And it does has this component because we said the compensation is the biggest possible sum that could be payable from, you know, repayable that, you know, that the loan would be repayable uh, from the income of uh, of rents. But it's still the biggest possible side, which is a uh, price which also acknowledges that there is some balancing here, you know, because it could be one euro, as I said, we could also say it should be one euro, you know, and there would be also, you know, there would be some good reasons at least to say so, right? Or one could say that there's all kinds of, you know, some, some other proposal would be to say, um, you know, the compensation should be the amount of money that, uh, that the original price, you know, from the times of privatization, or maybe original price plus only the material expenses. So let's say if they renovate these apartments, okay, we could compensate for this renovation, but um, but not the, the, you know, a lot of rise in value is purely speculative. It doesn't come from the fact that they invested something, it's just the dynamic of the speculative financial market. And that we, um, we strongly disagree that this should be an element, like why should the public sponsor or acknowledge or this compensation, the, the sheer speculative dynamic in the situation where the whole purpose of the socialization law would be to break the speculative dynamic. There would be almost a contradiction in terms. But that's basically exactly what I meant, that um, now the prices are somehow speculated on, on uh, yeah. depending on the location, on uh, maybe the renovation and so on. But once you say that the, the price uh, would need to be on 
like affordable rent and the rent is counted from mm -hmm. the percentage of the income of the renters, then I, I just remember the <laughs> the graph, which uh, I think uh, David Madden used it, uh, that uh, the, the rents and the income um, had decoupled in, in the last year. So that the price, like yeah. the, the prices yeah. of the rent uh, increase much faster than uh, the, the income. So I, I find it actually um, smart uh, that you are trying to go back to it and propose this calculation based on this. But also maybe um, have you thought, uh, because um, during your campaign uh, there was the rent cap, which is also mm -hmm. kind of uh, anti-speculative um, tool and it was meant to decrease some of the rents and if so even this could help to change or uh, decrease the the price of the of the flats but i actually thought that you are you you plan to use this to then get a lower price of the flats because once the, uh, there is a rent cap you cannot really speculate or use the uh, housing stock for for speculation or for profit and therefore the price decrease right it's much more complicated unfortunately <laughs> in many ways but also rent cap is an interesting question i mean just to just to, a small correction I, the the financial markets are way trickier so for example, indeed, once the rent cap was legislated, or even once it was announced that the city will legislate it, which uh, was in 2019, in June 2019, we observed that the stock, um, the stocks of Deutsche Bonn started falling, which means the, the, the price of the share started to fall down. However, the price of the share of the you know it's not identical with the price of apartments the dynamics are not completely separate but also they're not automatically connected so it's um i mean it, it demands almost like a whole separate lecture on the logic of financial markets let's, let's just leave it at it's a little bit more complicated however um yeah, the 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 meeting decker, the rental cap, or rental freeze, is it was an interesting case because in many ways we see um, rent cap as a side effect of our movements, and it is not just a speculation. I mean, it's been uh, the decision to legislate the rental freeze was in June 2019. In March 2019, there were polls that shows 50 percent support of us. And in my mode of being a researcher, I interviewed, among others, one of the lawyers that uh, wrote the rental cap, I mean, the, the actual law of the rental cap. And she was quite positive that she also fully sees the rent cap as a side effect of our initiative. Because, I mean, rent cap was also perceived as something that is so radical that it's almost communism. I mean, the, the activists have proposed rental cap some years before and the, you know, the SPD would be indeed saying it's like it borders communism, we cannot do it. However, once expropriation was in the game, all of a sudden turned out rent cap is perceived as a mild alternative or, or the reasonable compromise. So it also shows how, how the whole um, landscape, political landscape, has shifted and the idea of what is radical, what is a compromise. Um, the rent cap was also, as some of you surely know, was then legally reverted in the court. It was questioned by the Constitutional Court. And this wasn't a surprise. I mean, we knew that might be the case. I mean, we were never like, we were never, this movement was never actively active for rental cap, but of course we welcomed its legislation because it offered a, a much needed break for tenant also in the short term. We knew it's not enough uh, because even in the best case, if, if it weren't over 10, it would be just five years. And we could also observe already how these corporations are trying to go around it, for example, by trying to impose a five year long rental contracts instead of normal open-ended rented contracts, of course, looking forward then to exchange the tenants and uh, raise the rent after this five years. But what I personally find the most entertaining was that even if expropriation has been a more radical option than a rental cap, it's also legally much less controversial um, because um, the way that the rental cap was overturned was not because of the content of the law, but because of the questions of um, competence. So the rental cap was legislated by Berlin, which is a city and a state in the federal system. But because a similar 
law, the Mietpreisbremse, so like a rental or a stop break, was already legislated some years ago. I mean, a similar, you know, legally speaking, similar enough. Then it was argued it would have been the competence of the federal system and not the state or city of Berlin to do it. And on that base, really, it was overturned. Now, this kind of overturning would not happen to socialization, also because it is unprecedented. No one has ever done it, neither on federal nor state level. That means uh, you couldn't say. And in case if it's never been done on, on federal level, it can be done on the state level. I mean, the lawyers are quite confident about it. It doesn't mean that, you know, many um, conservative lawyers wouldn't try or conservative acts wouldn't try to question it. However, obviously, uh, the socialization um, has a backing in the Constitution. So, you know, it's much harder to, ar to, to argue successfully that something that is written into constitution is unconstitutional. Of course, you could still develop all those kinds of arguments, but no tenant regulation, including rent cap, had such a strong legal backing uh, as the idea of socialization, because indeed it is directly, literally, not metaphorically written um, into the constitution. And it uh, has its own article that belongs to the so-called um, basic Grundrechte, so fundamental laws of the constitution. And that gives it a very strong position within the German legal system. Thanks. I think Gabu wanted to ask something. Um, yeah, I was. I had a thought in, in calculating. I'm not going to propose another system, but um, as we know from public-private partnerships and all these like takeovers of um, of structures, the moment there should be renovation or houses are run down, very often it's heavily it's 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 likely given back to 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 the public. So I was just wondering, buying all these houses now or like all these apartments, and if we would think into the, the, the kind of society's interest, high level of ecologization, mm -hmm. of ecologizing. That would mean that from the money calculated, you would have to deduct a large sum of money, which the companies would also have to do if it was legally required. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just yeah. wondering to what extent the, the social, uh, the, the, the ecological issue wouldn't mm -hmm. have to have an enormous impact, and it would have, also on these companies, um, mm -hmm. um, if it was asked to actually really be implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is yeah, that yeah. a concern of yours? Or a well, I mean, it's an interesting speculation. I mean, we approach it from the other side. Like, so definitely one of our argument and definitely the reason why also so many ecological movements supported us uh, was that, yeah, all kinds of ecologic innovation in terms of housing is much cheaper and more possible on this big scale. And already, you know, Berlin has also some some state-owned housing, I mean, state-owned companies, and they already been experimented with so-called tenant um, electricity, which means putting solar panels on the rooftop and trying to at least have a share of, of uh, the power from, from the renewable sources. And uh, this was also possible because uh, these public companies negotiated better deals with you know, manufacturers of solar panels and, and so on and so on. And, and with the grid, um, it's just this kinds of innovation is always easier, cheaper and more sustainable on the bigger scale. And it's easier to coordinate it and therefore um, and so not just that, also it's 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 been known to everyone in Berlin that in the recent years uh, there was also legal loopholes. I mean, it's very hard to, you know, it, it, um, it was harder to raise a rent within an existing contracts, but there was a loophole that allowed to do it if you did a modernization. So that created an artificial conflict, so to say, between the social needs and ecological needs, because the this, uh, companies created the impression that, uh, or used the ecological modernization surely as a pretext to get rid of some tenants, start a new contract and raise the rent significantly. Therefore, also politically, you know, uh, creating an impression that these are opposing aims, 
worse than not. So, um, and yeah, especially Fridays for Future supporters is a lot to the extent that uh, I remember during the signature collection phase, there would be group of Friday for Future activists from other German cities like Frankfurt or uh, just traveling to Berlin just to help us collect signatures on the street and so on. And I wouldn't be surprised if ecological movements also come up with the initiative or try to use the uh, Article 15 for other initiatives because it allows not only land but also ecological resources to be socialized. And indeed, already there's been there there is a very fresh, relatively new referendum initiative that uh, argues for socializing electricity grids as uh, obviously uh, crucial um, infrastructure. Okay, I would like to invite also the audience, so please. Be brave and ask. But I think, I think, you know, you have been so um, uh, rich in, in, in telling us so many details. Um, I would understand uh, if, if it's, it needs to sink before it's being uh, brought yeah. into other places. Hopefully, <laughs> I would, I would for be sure. very happy been... for it to be a growing movement. Yeah, and we've been talking for 90 minutes now too, so it is yeah. a lot. Uh, a lot has been said. I would say. <laughs> Yeah, I think may maybe we should be uh, also somehow trying to to close it anyway because it was uh, it's it's really like to to keep it in a reasonable uh, length. So I think we should somehow convert towards towards the end. So I think take it, please, audience, take it as a one of the last chances to ask the <laughs> questions and learn something about the uh, uh, the Berlin famous movement. I would say almost uh, at the moment almost famous. OK, maybe I would have one more general question or one more really like particular question. Uh, can you so I, I will try to go with the particular question. Maybe Jona, can you explain us because you were talking that it is somehow grounded into the in the Constitution, which is on the state level, but the referendum uh, run in Berlin. So how does it apply, for example, to other cities? Can also other cities mm -hmm. uh, be inspired by what happened in Berlin? Can this somehow become a broader movement uh, through the whole Germany in a way? It's um, a little bit more complicated. So Berlin is, is in a very good position in this respect because it's a city and a state in the federal system uh, at the same time, because uh, Germany is a federal state. And there's been only um, Bremen and Hamburg are the only two big cities that uh, would have the same position. Because in order to, to legislate this, you need to have a status of the state. and. Um, and so that means, and, and this makes it much more difficult in terms of political mobilization for other cities, because that means you would have to also mobilize countryside, whereas the political interests um, might differ between city and the countryside. So let's say if Munich would have a similar idea, they would also, the referendum wouldn't be just among people from Munich, but also people from villages in Bavaria, which is completely different lifestyle, like less direct, Often, you know, they have private um, single family houses and so that's just not relevant for them that much was the apartment price in Munich. And so indeed that's, um, and that's a problem that's been often raised in politics, you know, that sometimes cities are in this bigger entities that, that uh, comply city in the countryside. And Berlin, of course, has a lot of specifics that uh, that is in favor, not just the fact that it does have a, a status of a state. It has also very um, particular political history um, and the long tradition of the housing movements uh, that um, that all surely contributed to to the political atmosphere that produced this particular initiative. Um, that means also, yes, that even the, if the housing crisis is global and maybe that's that's a good closing sentence. The solutions, I mean, one needs to be 
agile and flexible and learning to apply a mixture of local and global solutions. So it's good to learn between the cities from each other, not because we can copy the solutions one on one, but uh, because A, I mean, you know, even if the, this particular solution might not be applicable to other cities in, in Germany or beyond, it definitely moved the idea of what's even possible. I mean, the claim of expropriation uh, has become really famous. I mean, uh, as I said, I, I was responding to a lot of media requests and, you know, people from New York, London, all the cities that have this dire housing crisis, they were amazed uh, that uh, that you can ask for it and, and that you can ask for it in Germany, that in the end is also one of the world economic powers. I mean, it's not uh, a small... Um, you know, uh, weak uh, actor on the global scene is, is the opposite. But also land of, of, yeah, of seeking the solution in unusual places, um, be it in the conservative sphere of law, be it, you know, having all this unusual alliance. I think that, um, and that's the broader theme of my research too, I mean, neoliberalism is so effective because it has this skill of cooptation. It can cop even progressive. It can cop the idea of revolution and, and sell Coca-Cola with it, you know. And, and in some sense, to be politically smart, we need to do the opposite move as well. Like not just the old ideas of ideological purity, but we need to really invent new political collages, you know, to to tackle um, to to reinvent the system. And that that might be a good note to um, to finish with, especially a talk that happens in a gallery. So <laughs> new collages of politics uh, sounds like a good claim. Perfect. So uh, okay, maybe I'll give the last chance to the audience. So uh, I'll be talking, but if there is anyone who wants to still post a question, so please now is the last chance. Uh, I would like to thank you all. I would like to, of course, thank especially to Joanna but also to Gabu and Carolina to help with all the organization. I have to invite you still. There is one last thing to, to be said at least, which is that on Thursday, so in two days, on 10th of March, March, is it right in English? Okay. So on 10th of March, there is actually the finissage and Gabu herself will be coming to Brno. And also there will be uh, a lot of things to do in the gallery. So there will be, of course, a little party. And uh, But most importantly, we will present the, uh, the resulting manifesto. So please, all the uh, people from Brno, but also, also all around, so maybe from Slovakia, Vienna, and maybe even from Poland can come on Thursday uh, to, to Brno and join us uh, for the finissage. We will try to also broadcast it online, if possible, because there will be debate with uh, other like uh, yeah, intellectuals, maybe politicians, and uh, also other people from Brno. So you are all welcome and please come to, to the gallery to, to somehow wrap up this whole uh, thing that, that uh, Gabu initiated. So uh, last invitation and once again, big thanks to all of you and hopefully there will be other chance to, to meet somehow and uh, uh, maybe continue the debate, which would be uh, definitely necessary. So thanks, thanks to all of you. Yeah, thank you. Also, also, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Joanna. Very nice. Um, thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you Jan. for the wonderful invitation and um, yeah, enjoy the evening. Normally it would be the part we have a glass of wine, but you know, maybe next time. Yeah. <laughs> and very much success with the initiative. Thank you. It's amazing. Okay. Yes, so thanks and bye. Have a next. good evening. Bye. Bye. bye.